where are you going? To a pub. To a pub? Yeah. Mm, okay. You're allowed to drink in a pub? Bye. Sorry? Bye. That's rude. <laughs> That's not. You want to talk to me? No. That's rude. Okay. Very rude. Okay. Are you allowed to drink in a pub, Naomi? You're old enough. Obviously, she knows I'm not old enough to drink in a pub, so why ask? It's a bit of an obvious question. Sixteen-year-old Naomi Fish's blatant defiance of the rules has left her mum powerless to control her. I tried everything from shouting back to taking away um, privileges like money, telephones, anything I could think of, nothing worked. Naomi had to sit her GCSEs a year late after being kicked out of school. She's been a law unto herself ever since her parents split up three years ago. She was just very angry, as, as I guess you'd expect. She, she wasn't happy about the situation at all, you know, she wanted us to be a family. Like when they told us and stuff, like everyone cried, but I'm the kind of person who's not to cry, to keep my emotions like bottled up. But that is basically when things just started going out of control after that. So what time are you going to be in tonight? I'm not too sure, Mary. Could you give me a time, please? Three, four, five... How about two o'clock? Nine. Yes, please. Nine, Mum. Most of the time, I'll just end up walking out because I can't really be able to argue with her anymore. And if you can't live with someone at all and it's just hell, of course you feel you failed. I hope that this trip helps her to communicate with me, communicate with her mother, better than she's been able to up to now. Sixteen-year-old Ross Torrey spends all of his spare time on his computer. This is my MySpace so far, and I couldn't live without it. Ross goes online every day until the early hours of the morning, and his parents are at their wit's end. Ross will gradually get more and more verbally abusive. He'll he'll shout, he will swear. It just gets worse and worse until you eventually give in to him. A year ago, 16-year-old Ross came out to his parents as gay, but turned to the internet to meet other gay teenagers. I have found boyfriends in my space, found quite a couple. It's very worrying the fact that he will go and meet people who he's only met through the internet. We just have to hope that he's being sensible. Nice and sexy pants, I'd give you one. I'd grab your crutch. Despite his parents' full support, Ross has struggled to control his emotional outbursts. Look, Ross, Jessica is ten years old. She why is should she be, anyway. No, she doesn't. And why should she be subjected to continuous swearing? After he came out, it was as if all the anger came with it. All of a sudden, he had to live up to this image of being this nasty, sort of, bitchy guy. I just changed myself, changed my appearance, changed everything. He'll say things like he would love nothing more than to sit there and watch us burn and die and be in pain. And then take a photo of it. Six former Ross refuses to lift a finger at home, but still expects his parents to support him financially. When I go to college, I expect them you to pay me £31 a month for a bus pass. It doesn't, it don't just mean it's just yeah. shut up, talking. Uh, yes, we do pay. Yeah. No, I'm talking, I'm talking. Go bus fare for sixth form. I think he does need to find the real Ross again. I think he knows the real Ross. He knows, he knows that person because uh, he was a happy, um, really loving child. Now things are about to change. Both teens' parents have agreed to send them to America to experience strict parenting firsthand. I'm definitely right at life at home, so we're quite diseased, I actually think, and I will miss it a lot. I'm actually really excited about going to Alabama now, because like packing and stuff, it makes it official, I guess. I don't know, it's been, it's been great. For the next eight days, Ross and Naomi will be away from their friends and family for the first time in their lives. <sighs> See you later, yeah? Don't, because you know you'll get me crying. Yeah. Yes. yes. Goodbye. Okay. Goodbye. Okay. Yes, Mum. I don't expect him all of a sudden to come home and start doing the washing and ironing and things I like do. that. <laughs> it would be nice, but um, no, just a, a few, you know, the please, the thank yous, and a bit of decency. Have she comes back with knowing herself and what she's about? 
I don't even know where Alabama was till today. I was like, where is Alabama? <laughs> no, I didn't know there was such a place called Alabama. Alabama, one of the top like this. Oh no. The teens are being sent to Alabama, 4,000 miles away, where they'll be staying with the Garnets, a deeply religious conservative family. Satan wants to devour our kids. He wants to pull them away. He wants to, to, to bring them into darkness. So it's my job to not let him do that. Mum Lynn is a part-time teacher. And Dad Mark works for a large pharmaceutical company. And they are the proud parents to 16-year-old Hunter, 14-year-old Mitchell, and 12-year-old Heather. And my parents just make sure everything is appropriate for a 12-year-old godly girl before I go and do anything. You put your thumb in your neck right here, and you put your hand down. If your shirt comes below that, then it's probably too short. This is the driving contract that uh, my dad wrote up for me. It has 15 rules on there, what I should and should not do when I'm driving in the car. In the Garnett household, there are no locks on the doors. The parents feel it's their right to control every aspect of their children's lives. We don't want our kids to lose their innocence before it's time. They dictate the music they listen to. We just kind of go through the songs and, and see what he's got. And there's sometimes when I say, you know what, I heard a word in that song, buddy. It's off. Let's get it off. They control the TV they watch and know all their children's internet passwords. Someone's going to raise them. It's either going to be MTV and MySpace or it's going to be Mark and Lynn. And I choose Mark and Lynn. The Garnets absolutely believe their unique style of parenting could make a difference to the British teenagers' lives. I'd like for them to be able to see that, you know what, here's a family that loves each other unconditionally, that has fun, and they do it, you know, based on biblical principles and biblical laws, and they're not a bunch of fuddy-duddies. After a nine-hour flight, Naomi and Ross touch down in America. Alabama has some of the strictest state laws in America. Smoking is illegal for anyone under 19. Heaviest. It's also a deeply religious state. In the UK, only 10% of people regularly attend church, but in Alabama, it's over 75%. Are we looking at those desperate housewives? Really American, aren't they? They're getting mad in a hot American dream. Did you see? Dry. So I'm scared. I never get mad. I'm shitting myself. I'm now really scared. This is worse than anything. It's I've like ever when you're just about to go on a roller coaster or something. And not even like that. It's even worse. It's, that. it's like you're about to meet your death. Guys, <laughs> how are you? How are you? I'm more. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's fine. It's fine. Hey, listen. It Y'all never rains in Alabama. <laughs> and it rains, of there course, you go. right on now. The on today. Yeah. Hey, watch your step. These steps are kind of steep. I wouldn't. Hi, hey, this is Naomi. I'm Mitchell. Yeah, go right here. I'm Hunter. Hey, my name's Heather. Hi, hey, Ross. Hey, my name's Heather. Cool. I'm Hunter. Cool. Hey, I'm Mitchell. We're glad you're here. Welcome to our home. We're all glad we've been excited about this. So, everybody just wanted to welcome y'all and make you feel at home. And they can't tell you how privileged we are and thrilled to y'all here. Thank you. Yeah, no, seriously. We're all, really excited. It's going to be a great eight day journey. The Garnets live in a sprawling five-bedroom house spread over three floors with its own private swimming pool. The Garnet children have given their bedrooms over to Ross and Naomi for the week. Okay, and this is Hunter's bedroom. And Ross, I think this is where you're going to be staying. You're not going to find TVs and computers in here. Okay, and this is Heather's room. And we're going to get you set up so you'll be comfortable. And that kind of but before thing. the British oh, teens can get unpacked, the Garnets lay down some ground rules. First on the list, is foul language. One thing that we we don't tolerate in the least is any kind of profanity. So no f bombs. Uh, you know, sh. You know, a hole. The nuclear bomb of profanity for us is to take the Lord's name in vain. Heather, you know, is, is at an age where she would probably faint if she heard you know that in our house. We're very interested in every aspect of our kids' lives. We, you know, we monitor the internet. We don't allow inappropriate websites, and we monitor what they download and what's on their iPods and even on their cell phones. It's the exact same thing with the TV, and we don't bend on that one. Um, one thing that we don't allow in this home is alcohol, and we don't allow smoking. Um, I'm going to give you an opportunity to go upstairs, and in your suitcase, if you brought anything with you that you know and right now you know in your heart, 
if it violates any of the things we've talked about. Um, this is an amnesty time. It's a time for you to go get it. No harm, no foul, and bring it to us. Sound fair? Good, excellent. Used to having complete free reign, the strict regime comes as a bit of a shock to the unruly British teens. What the F-bomb, honestly, a-hole. I said a-hole, oh dear. Oh my God. You can almost see her nipple hair, okay? <laughs> yeah, I think, I think it's completely over the top. Like, they should, I don't know. It's, it's just, it just doesn't seem, it just doesn't seem human almost that you're not allowed to see the things that go on outside of these walls. There's no need to be continuously looking over this, looking at them, watching what they're doing and stuff. I mean, come on. Yeah, I really doubt they're gonna like the magazines. So I'm gonna get rid of those and my iPod. Um, but I'm not giving them my cigarettes. I put them in here, they're actually in my pocket. I don't even have that many. I have seven. But I'm just gonna keep them. Thanks. Nice. <laughs> there is nothing explicit. I don't have any magazines and stuff. What we're gonna do now, we're gonna go check your bags. Before we do that, any still got an amnesty second chance. Anything else that yeah. uh um, my cigarettes six. in my bag. Six, six. <laughs> the Garnet children are regularly subjected to random bag checks, and the British teens are no exception. There might be a baby bathing suit issue if this is any part of what she thinks we might wear outside. It's probably not going to happen. Didn't you wear myself when they said that her daughter fainted if they had a swim? Yeah, I know. What was I that? would die. I, I think my dad would actually faint. <laughs> oh, I had to hold my teeth up. I was like, because <laughs> I thought it was an alarm. Oh, when you get because you get them putting your head down. Like, and, oh, I just just some of the things said, they were saying. I just, just wanted to laugh. Please don't do it because you'll make me laugh. It's a bit over the top. It is really over the top. It even tells her it's bad for her. smoking kills. Mm -hmm. The iPod looks very uh, acceptable. Is my stuff okay? Oh no, they're looking for my pictures! Oh shit! <laughs> no! My honey! My honey! They're be drunk at my face. Oh shit! These photos are, are, are really fairly benign. With over 300 photos on Ross's camera, Mark has failed to notice his drunken snaps. You know, I, don't, I don't have a whole lot of problem with them, to be honest with you. That is so rude. How dare they go for my pictures? At least the curse and decency fucking ask. Okay, and I know we were going so long, I'm so sorry. I'm I'm livid. I'm absolutely I think that's so rude. What is rude? Looking for I think you should have the decency to ask. Can we go through your camera please? And then I would have quite happily agreed. But the fact you just done it behind my back, I think is really, really disrespectful to me and rude. I will say this, you know, our house is very personal. Um, and so anything that's brought into our house is open for inspection. And on this front, Naomi, on the cigarette front, let me also mention to you this. There's beginning an eroding of trust, and that's not what we want. Therefore, it's got to be earned back. I don't think it is fair at all that they've taken my cigarettes, but for now I'm feeling all right about it because I have had a couple of fags today before I came here. Um, but I know that tomorrow all hell will break loose because I literally, if I don't have a cigarette, I will, I can't, I can't function properly. I realised having a go about my camera, I control myself. But I think probably by tomorrow, latest the third day. I think I'll probably break. Despite their shaky start, Mark still believes he can get through to Ross and Naomi. They're both really, really good kids, and you can see that. It's almost like a shell, like an exterior, but it's one that's transparent. And though it's hard, and and it's a you know it's a you know it's a hard shell, you can see on the inside already, and you can see that there's a there's so much good in there. Ross has only been in the house a couple of hours and already he's asked to check his MySpace profile. I am not, I'm pretty computer illiterate. Unlike at home, in the Garnet household, he'll be closely monitored at all times. MySpace is literally like my world. What is it that you're trying to accomplish by putting a photo like that? Because that's pretty provocative. I am very insecure. 
And by doing something like that, get so many good replies, it sort of made me begin to some reason feel better. Mm -hmm. The people that reply, do you know them? Do you mo know most of them? Or are these, or these anonymous people? Um, I know just... a lot of them, and uh, some of them I don't know. And do people ever send you messages that you find offensive? Oh, yeah. A lot of abuse messages on here, telling people, people telling me to go and kill myself. Are you serious? Mm, I, I can probably try and find one for you. Um, I've had people telling me to go and shove my fingers down my scrapey little throat and make myself sick because I'm a fat person. Mm. It's horrible. Well, i got to tell you, man, that breaks my heart. People are horrible. People are that. horrible in here. They are, you get some evil people, I tell you. As much enjoyment as you may get out of this, I would argue that the damage you receive from it might counter a lot of that, if not all of it. So because I care about your safety and, and the, and the well-being of you emotionally, that's why I'm going to ask you not to go on this, this particular account this week. How do you feel about that? I could probably give it a go and see how it lasts, yeah. I mean, I've, never, I've actually never lived about my space. I've never gone a day about it, really. That just kind of broke my heart, to be honest with you, to know that he's getting his esteem and his value and his worth from people he's never met. I can't tell you how much I appreciate him being candid about it and very forthright. At the same time, the level of alarm is through the roof. It's making me hot, honestly. It's like, what good did that, does that help? Oh, well, we don't want any abuse being brought into the house, Ross. Shut up. That's not mine. That's not mine. Over dinner, Naomi takes the opportunity to tell the Garnets what she thinks of their overprotective parenting. <laughs> you said that um, you're trying to teach them for the outside world and stuff, but the outside world does have yeah all the things that you're protecting your children from. I mean, they're aware of you know the world and cussing and movie and sex and whatever the case may be. There's things we talk about. They're open to that, but it's not something that he fills his mind with on a daily yeah. basis. And we want our kids to become the best adults they can be, and we want for y'all, as you enter adulthood, to maybe question some of the decisions you've been making in the past and saying, you know what, these may not be the best choices I'm making when I'm entering into adulthood. Do you have a real thorough understanding of the, the and expectations we, are? And why we do what we do. Yeah. yeah. All right, well, let's clean up, and, and we'll uh, kind of wind down and get ready for bed here. It's only the end of day one, but already the teens are outraged by the level of parental control. They're all robots. The parents have literally robotized these kids. They're going to go into the world and not know jack shit. They're, their parents are going to think they do. I'm worried for the kids. Because when these kids go outside into the real world, they're not going to be able to cope. The Garnett children are on their school summer holidays. But rather than laze around, they're expected to do charity work for up to a week at a time. Do we get paid for this work today? You're helping the homeless people. It's like, okay, yeah, where's my tip? <laughs> Teenagers can be selfish. We all can. But it's hard to be self-centered and selfish and caught up in yourself when you are looking at others that are less fortunate than you and realize, wow, I don't have it nearly as bad as I thought I did. Today, the British teens will be helping the Garnett's youngest son, Mitchell, who is volunteering at the firehouse shelter, a refuge for homeless men. The shelter is in downtown Birmingham, an area with high crime and unemployment. It's a world away from the Garnett's secluded suburbs, only 10 miles up the road. During their shift, Naomi and Ross will be answering to the shelter's manager, Melvin. Good morning, everybody. Well, they're here to volunteer. They're here to work and help out and they want to assist in serving and I told them that you all wouldn't mind. Far from resenting the hard work, Mitchell actually enjoys it. My dad is right about it being good for our family, just being to, able to like help others that might not be as fortunate as us, uh, help them before we help ourselves. Okay, so let's go on out here, you all. We're going to go out front and get ready to start lunch. The shelter provides hot meals every day for up to 200 homeless men and is run almost entirely by volunteers. Volunteers are our lifeline here at the shelter. Without, without our volunteers, you know, we wouldn't make it. The teens are only 10 minutes into the lunch service and Ross has already given up. I've got dirt on my shoes. I've got shit on them. 
I need some tissue. No one's getting me in it. I'm going myself. With the lunch queue beginning to build, Ross and Naomi are nowhere to be seen. What are y'all doing around there? Maybe we oh. walk. A walk? Yeah. We've come back now, haven't we? No, 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 no. You all don't know the seriousness of, of this area here. You put your lives in jeopardy. We didn't grow very far. These people hurt people around here. Okay. They kill people, they cut people, they stab people. You have to think before you do things like that, Naomi. Put that bag over here and come on here. What take the pay! Is that going to change it? Ross never helps out at home and is struggling to see the point in washing up for people in need. And quit using those words in here. It's a matter of respect. You may not respect nobody at home, but you're going to respect us here in this facility. You understand that? Yeah. I had her volunteers, but we're not slaves. We're not volunteering to be their fucking skivvies for the day. And my hair. I want to stop from it, it's my hair. The teens haven't been back long before they're in trouble again. I want to have a talk with you in the office in here about what just happened with those smokes with the cigarette. Naomi has persuaded one of the homeless men to break the law by giving her a cigarette. The guy that gave you that cigarette, he knows better we don't do that here. Now he's gonna have to find somewhere else to go stay. He's gonna be homeless again. He's back out on the streets again because, or because you asked for a cigarette. Just because he gave me a cigarette, he's gonna be homeless? Yes. Yeah, but that's out of order because it was my fault. So well, I should get a punishment for it, not him. You probably will. So we understood each other? Yeah. Hmm? Yes. Okay. It's 5 p.m. and Mark is keen to find out how the teens have got on at the shelter. I've been forced into cleaning about a thousand pots. I couldn't cope, there was no break in between and my shoes got dirty and I was just so hot. Did you drop the F-bomb? Yeah, I think So you dropped the F-bomb on these homeless men? Yeah, I think so. I think they heard it. Do you have any earthly idea how offensive it is that you would be offended and doing work for the homeless? And B, how offensive it is for you to drop the F-bomb in their presence? Excuse me. Hey, excuse me, can I just have your attention for just a moment? Um, Ross has been working here today and an incident took place that was inappropriate and, uh, and there's something he would like to say to you. I'd like to apologize for my foul language that like if some of you heard today, and I'm sorry that I said it in front of you and disrespected you and I hope that you do have a nice evening, this evening. Yeah. Thank you. Naomi has a confession of her own to make. I asked someone for a cigarette, um, and they got in us trouble. He can't stay here anymore. So he's, oh. he's out on the street tonight. Yeah. These men are begging to be able to get into a shelter like this because there's murders on the street here every night. You put this gentleman in a situation that now he's in danger. Well, I didn't know that that was going to happen. But you don't understand that your actions have major ramifications, major consequences on other people. You've got to take responsibility for your actions. I'm going to give you an opportunity to come back tomorrow with an unbelievably great attitude and great work ethic. If tomorrow goes incident free, then we're going to take this and put it behind us. Okay. I'm beyond disappointed. Uh, what I'm having to do is try to fight back uh, irritation and being furious about it. Bitterly, bitterly disappointed. Now that man's homeless because I asked him for a cigarette. I, to be honest, that's completely over the top and that shouldn't have happened. And if I could go back and change it, I really would. Like, I really do feel so bad about that. And, I don't know what else to do. Over the past two days, Ross has found it difficult adjusting to the Garnett style of parenting. This is a letter um, from your mom and dad, um, and it's a letter to you. Today he receives a letter from home, a reminder from his parents about why he's come to Alabama.
You really liked the person you were, you were, Ross. That all changed, Ross, when you came out last year about your sexuality. You had the whole, the whole of your family support, and yet you seem to turn against us. The names that you have called us, and some of the things that you have said, have brought both me and Mum to tears at, at times. When you said that you would like to see us burn and take pictures while it happened, that hurt us more than you will ever know. How does that make you feel? Pretty sick, really. Ill. Really? Quite ill. And, and just the feeling that must have for your father putting his head on the pillow and trying to go to sleep at night, it, it literally, you know, right even now, it's kind of making my stomach churn. Almost I can't fathom that. I'm so wrapped up in myself. I just didn't care about him. I just cared about myself and how I felt and what I was going for and what they was doing to me. I didn't really think that what I was supposed to do with them. I've still got time to fix it and to learn how to apologise and try and sort my, set myself out. Naomi, would you like a cinnamon roll? Oh, no, thank you. Would you like it, Ross? No. Sure. It's the teen's third day in Alabama and today they're returning to the shelter, but not before Mark gives them a pep talk. I kind of wanted to give you all a few words of encouragement. And Hunter, you're going to be going with them today as well. And I'm not going to go spouting Bible verses all the time, but it says anytime you set your hand to do something, do it with everything you've got. So as you go about today, have that great attitude. Think about the joy you're bringing to these people. You're going to do a great job today. I really think I'm going to drop it. <laughs> We did act a bit like sport practice yesterday. It's a bit embarrassing to be honest. Um, we have a lot more things than they have. A lot more things. And we still were complaining about what we were doing. Yeah. And that's not that's not right, like just get on with it and do it. Let's go, let's go! Let's do this. <laughs> there they're going too fast for me. I'm having to keep style. up with them. Oh I'm sorry, that wasn't any reason. And it looked like they were having fun doing it. <laughs> But the events of yesterday are still weighing heavily on Naomi's mind. I was just wondering if you know where that man is. That that was um, his name is John, mm. and uh, I haven't seen him, and I don't know when he'll be back here in Birmingham, or even if he does come back. But if he comes back, we can tell him I said sorry. Yes, I know. I feel like really horrible about it. Do like, you? I really do. Yeah. I really, 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 really do. Yeah. Well. I understand. I think I would have to if I was you. I didn't get a chance to say sorry to him, and I don't want him to like be wherever he is now and just think that I didn't. I don't care mm -hmm. because I do. I do care. I think you do. I'll make sure I tell him for you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. After a second day at the shelter, Mark is hopeful for a better report. So how did things go today? It went great today. Great. Yeah, uh, they were outstanding. Excellent. I just, I just love them both. I knew y'all were going to do uh, great in terms of your work ethic and in terms of your attitude, so y'all have knocked it out. Congratulations and thank you so much. I am so, so proud of you. I can't tell you how proud I am of you. That is outstanding. That is outstanding. You are awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Y'all have done a great service today. Oh, I'm so proud of you. Outstanding. Oh, wow. Well, let's go. Y'all ready to go? Yeah. yeah. Let's go home. We're going to have a great afternoon and a great evening. The, the way the way he chose his words and what he said it kind of made me want to cry like not with being upset but just with what he was saying like he is so sincere and he really means everything that he says and I don't know like after you've had a chat with him you just want to like smile and jump around and be like yay. Mark makes a point of telling his kids how proud he is of them every day. I didn't hear, I'm proud of you, son, from my dad until the day before he passed away. And I remember I was actually putting his slippers on. Um, and, uh, and I just looked up at him, and that's when he said it. He said, I just want to tell you how proud you've made me over the years and how proud I am of the man you've become and the father you've become. And um, I'll never forget that. It was great. See you later. Good evening. Bye. As a reward for their hard work, Mark has given Ross and Naomi permission to go bowling with Hunter. All right, guys, here we go. Big night out on the town bowling. Hunter, you're driving. Oh, yes. Hey, Naomi and Ross, let me let me just have a real quick word with you. Yeah. Hunter, if you will, just go ahead and get in the car. You'll be right there, buddy. 
Hey, um, obviously this is going to be a great night. You're going to have a wonderful time. You did a phenomenal job today. We're so proud of you. Uh, but as you go out and enjoy yourselves tonight, do not forget about your responsibilities and commitments. Naomi, I'm not going to do any cigarettes. You know what? I, you're going to do. Oh, I know you're going to do nice. great tonight. It's going to be tempting though, because really this is the first time you've been away from us completely. Um, where you're just going to have a chance to enjoy yourself, and I know that would be tempting, so I'm going to be praying for you. You're going to do a great job. I have faith in you. Y'all have fun. Enjoy yourselves. Yeah, y'all are going to have a blast. Unlike the UK teens, nights out for 16-year-old Hunter and his friends are a treat. They must be earned, carry huge responsibility, and come with a curfew of 9 p.m. It's the first chance for the teens to enjoy themselves unsupervised. Half an hour into their bowling evening, Ross spots the bar. But anyone got a spare cigarette or anything? Has anyone got a spare suit? Ross knows it's illegal to smoke in Alabama under the age of 19. Flouting the rules is his speciality. But he's determined not to be the only one that gets into trouble. Come on! Come on! Come on. Oh my God! Y'all shouldn't be smoking. Shit. I'm, I'm thinking of your dad now, right now. Then why are you doing it? Y'all are putting me in an awkward position. I mean... Sorry. It's, I mean, it's fine. I, Sorry. It's just my, my parents expect me to tell them stuff. But no, please don't tell them. Just don't do it. <laughs> please don't tell them. <laughs> I mean, I don't want to be the bad guy here, but... No it's kind of hard not to. Shit. You don't, I don't think I should have done that. I guess I was a little disappointed in what they were, what they just did. I, I have to struggle with what to do now. Pick them or pick my parents. Thank you. Hey guys. Hello. Hey. How's it going? Good. Good. Tell me about bowling. I mean, nobody got in trouble. Uh. Kind of. No. Yeah, a little. What happened? I don't know. Do y'all want to tell her or do you want me to? <laughs> I want to hear from your, I want to hear your side we'll and I want to hear your we'll side. Say. I'll say. I'll okay, Ross will say. Um, Shall get wild? We had a sig. Mm. You had a sig? Both of you? We had what, um, we both, we both shared one. We, Where'd you get it? This lady. So you just asked some stranger, can I have a cigarette? Yeah. Why? You don't even smoke, Ross. Hello there. Hello. How are you? How'd it go? I'm gonna have fun. But I'm not so sure. So everything, I mean, is everything okay? I think so, but they broke our rules. Okay. Um, really? Um, Can you tell me about the conversation that took place on the driveway? Thank because you. you looked me in the eyes, which I'd like for you to do right now, and you told me what? Um, I wasn't going to smoke. I can't have you look me in the eye and tell me one thing, and then I guess, I don't know, an hour, two hours, however long later, just go ahead and just, you know, drop your pants and put it in a toilet bowl. We didn't want to tell you, but Hunter obviously wanted to tell you because I was here getting into trouble. So if Hunter hadn't have seen you, we would have never known. Mm -hmm. And everything would have been great, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. the, the whole no one will ever know thing just rips apart, obliterates trust. It just destroys faith. But it was a thing. It was a cigarette. It, it, and it wasn't a whole one, it was a couple of puffs each. But uh, that has nothing to do with it. I, I couldn't give two flips about the cigarette, to be honest with you. you. You guys have lost complete sight of what's important. If we can't trust you, and we can't have any faith in you, there, there's just nothing here. There's just nothing here. So I don't see how we can lose all your complete faith and trust out of it. I don't. 
Sorry, just died. We're trying to do our best to show you what unconditional love looks like, and you continue to just piss it back in our faces. And it just drives me up the wall. It just drives me up the wall. I'm just sorry about this whole situation and for being here in the first place, really. I just want to go home. Your lives are, because again, it wraps around you. It's all about you. Well, however it makes someone else feel, you don't care. And I'm sorry if that hurts your feelings. But no, I think see, it doesn't even hurt your feelings because you don't give a rip. Because it's not important to you. You do. Because we know it's not true. You know what? I'm done here. You guys have a Coke and a smile, a great evening. And um, I get those plane tickets ready. Thanks, man. This is worthless. It really is. Guys. He's mad. Yeah, I think I've expressed you know enough. What? I do care. Get upstairs. Mark. I'm dead serious. Calm Get down. upstairs. Just go to bed. Thank no, you, you go to bed. Get upstairs. That's what I'm Get upstairs, about. Ross. If you wouldn't have found out, none of this would happen. So you wouldn't have been in a bad mood, and then everyone would have been fine. No one would have got hurt, and we would have got our cigarettes. Because you would have never ever found out. So, well, so why did he get so angry about that? <laughs> it's like the whole joy. He joined. I'm sorry that, not, that he got so mad. That's what happens. He's passionate about this. I would probably handle it differently. But I also have to support him because I'm my husband. Definitely. So, <coughs> let's just go to bed. You know what I'm saying? And wake up in the morning and figure out what we're going to do. Anyway. Tomorrow's another day. Tomorrow's another day. Y'all be thinking about what happened. Okay. All right, guys. Y'all sleep, sleep well. good. Thank you. Thank you. Even though... They're like very nice people and I still like think of them as friends. It is hard to respect them just as much as I did before after what they did tonight. The teens are halfway through their week in Alabama. The whole experience is proving more challenging than Mark expected. Last night was, was bitterly disappointing on so many different levels. Where I am now in life, it takes an awful lot for me to, to really approach losing my temper. Uh, there is a time in the past where it didn't take much at all, but I've worked hard on that, and it really does. It takes a whole lot now. Ross and Naomi weren't on my mind this morning. It was their parents that were. As frustrating as it was for me, I realized that if I had to endure that day after day after day, you know, I'm not so sure I wouldn't grab the white flag and start waving it as well. After a good night's sleep, Naomi has had a chance to reflect on the events of yesterday. I really shouldn't have taken it because it was a big deal to him. Like, he got really upset about it, really upset. I just didn't really think of the consequences. It affected everyone and it was a bit selfish, really. I shouldn't have done it. The teenager's behaviour last night has led Mark to take action. What we've decided to do with them today is we've decided to separate Ross and Naomi. Uh, I think we've come to the full realization that they have partnered up and we certainly want them to be friends and, and to enjoy each other's company, but to, to their detriment, no. And that's what it's become. You're going to spend some time at the shelter with Melvin and Naomi's going to help me here. And I know that may be something that you're not looking forward to, but life sometimes is just not always doing what we want to do. I feel so sick. They're making me feel ill. They're not, they don't understand. I'm emotionally, emotionally drained out. I'm physically fucking tired. I feel so ill. But they're not giving me a fucking break. I'm going to go back to this poxy ass place. Which I hate. Not used to being told what to do, Ross decides to walk off. Oh, I know you can hear me. Once again, you gotta think about what you're doing to somebody else. I've gotta come find you. I'm dressed up, ready to go to work. It's burning up out here. So, don't just run away without permission. That's just not the way it works. That way. We can't walk that way, we gotta go. So let's walk this way. I know, I know, I know you want some free time. Well, what, what are some coping skills you can do? 
I feel like probably this is what he does at home, and his parents have to deal with that. With, with the, you know, I'm, anything that's not suitable to him is met with a fit or an escape or, uh, you know, cursing or whatever the case may be. And that he needs to grow up and be able to communicate it back and, you know, share his feelings, but not always just a immature reaction. I'm back. Yeah. Okay. Back at the house, Naomi finally begins to open up to Mark. Well, I said sorry last night, but I didn't really... I, I did mean it, but I didn't really mean it. And now I'm saying sorry, and I sincerely mean it. Like, I'm sorry. Obviously, I got very passionate last night, and I got passionate because I care. Mm -hmm. I hope I didn't come across as being passionate because I stopped caring. No. I appreciate you. I appreciate you, too. Well, thank you. <laughs> Can I give you a hug? Yeah. Is that okay? Yeah. You're so sweet. I'm glad that he forgave me and that he just wants to move forward and that he's not... Like, because certain people would be like, yeah, I forgive you, but then they'll just bring it up. And I know that he won't, and we'll just move on from that. Since her parents' breakup when she was 13, Naomi and her mum have struggled to communicate with each other. Today, Naomi has received a letter from home. Life sometimes brings pain in difficult situations. <laughs> oh, no, I'm crying. Um, we as a family and a fair share of those. Your uncle's death, your grandmother's death, your father's illness and your dad and I splitting up. Those were very painful times for all of us and I'm sorry if I was not always there for you during some of those difficulties. I was in pain too, just like we all were. And then being a mum was difficult and I might have gotten it wrong, sorry. I was not aware of all the difficult times that you went through. I'm sorry that I did not notice. We never really like, talk about the past and stuff and... I don't know, just because she kept on saying sorry and... I don't know. <laughs> At the homeless shelter, rather than throw a fit, Ross has knuckled down. Time alone has given him a chance to reflect, and he's opened up to one of the shelter's residents. I know deep down what people are saying is true. Do you want to change? Yeah. You want to make your life better? Mm. You, you, I don't know how to change. You can learn anything you put your mind to. You, you yeah. learn from your mistakes. Always keeping your guard up and don't let nobody in, you're gonna fall. I just learned that as a couple of weeks ago. You got to let somebody in, let somebody talk to you. You got to sit back and look, learn, and listen. That's the only way you're gonna get somewhere. The Garnets encourage their children to talk to them about everything by spending quality one on one time with each of them. You know, I'm really looking forward to taking Naomi to, out tonight. You know, we've gotten closer over the course of the week, but I get a good chance tonight to, to gain some real fresh insight and new insight and meaningful insight into her life. Tonight, Mark is taking Naomi out for dinner. The Garnets call it a daddy-daughter date. Mark does this with Heather. They go on daddy-daughter dates all the time. And it discusses things at the table that she may not want to discuss with me. It's just time for us to be by ourselves and for me to ask her about school, about what's going on in her life. Just really an opportunity to make sure that we're always connected. So it's always a very, very special time. After you. Y'all have fun. We'll see you guys. Y'all have a great Bye. evening. Bye. Cheers. Bye. And we've arrived. This is Leonardo. You're gonna love this. You ready? Yep. You go right through here. I'll follow you. Well, have you always been kind of private, you know, and kind of quiet? I used to like say what I felt and act how I felt. Right. But I just, I just, I've just stopped doing that. I've changed a lot. Well, I'm not trying to get ultra personal, but why? What's taking place that makes you really kind of afraid to trust people and, and be vulnerable to people and, and share stuff like that to people? I mean, it sounds like you've really gotten burned. Yeah, no, there's just been a lot of drama in our family. 
we are very close. But we, yeah, we were close as a family. We were. There's a lot of arguing and stuff. But I just thought they were like going through a rough patch kind of thing. Right. Um, and yeah. And then they just broke up and I was, I was quite like, I was shocked. But I wasn't that, I don't know. I wasn't that upset. But I think it did, it did break my trust for people because my parents hadn't told me anything about it, I guess. And then I was like, well, if I can't trust you, then who can I trust? Now that your mom has written you this letter, will that change anything? Yeah, it will, but it's more just its experience, really, that's going to change things. Have you really been who you are either are or are capable of being this week? I mean, is this, are we seeing the real you? You're, you're seeing what I would like to be. So it's what you can be. Yeah. Yeah. When Mark asked me, Naomi, I want to go on a date, I was like, okay. <laughs> I was thinking, great, it's going to be cringe, but it wasn't at all like he, he somehow makes it comfortable. I just can't talk to my parents about stuff right? like that. I just clam up. It's just not, it's not like natural to me. Back at the house, Ross has been doing some soul searching and is finally coming to terms with his behaviour. I'm so full of myself that I've just not cared about anyone else out there, not anyone else's feelings. <laughs> and that I say I'm being everything that runs around me, it's true, I've, and I brag about myself. It's horrible. It makes me feel horrible. It's a habit to get, you know, to treat people unkindly. It's a habit to um, be self-centered. It's, you know, so they die hard. It's time for the little boy to sit down and this real man needs to stand up and he's becoming a man and he needs to be able to stand up and do that. Mark's personal experience has taught him how difficult the teenage years can be. I, I drank to excess, I developed a dependency on alcohol. It's one of the reasons that I'm so adamant about protecting my children from those same kinds of horrible mistakes. Throwing the kids to the wind and hoping for the best and letting them stumble into adulthood by themselves. I can't imagine anything more irresponsible or more detrimental to a child's development. I'm just gonna let it go. Everything. And just flick it and let it go. Mark leaves nothing to chance with his own teenage sons. When Hunter turned 16, Mark took him away for the weekend to talk about sex and purity. I learned so much about him when we're, when we're together just one on one. It, it builds the trust in each other, it builds our relationship. But it's also a, just a critical time for us to be, to be together and get away without distraction in order to, to talk about really, really important subjects as they cross that bridge from adolescence into manhood. With only one day left before the teens return home, Mark has taken Ross away to have the same frank discussion. Nice. Hello, fish. Fish meet Ross. Ross meet fish. So uh, there's your friend. There Can I hold him? Uh, yeah. Now, Try to grab him like I did, so hold those fins so they don't come back and nip you. Ah! Ah! That's okay, we're gonna put him right back in. There you go, buddy. Throughout his teenage years, Ross has struggled with his low self-esteem. I've never been in a relationship longer than that month and two weeks. Have I... you met all of these guys on MySpace? Yep, yeah, but some of my friends knew. It's really rare that anybody makes a meaningful meeting and, and has a meaningful relationship through the internet. Obviously being gay it's not as easy as it being straight because how often do a, does a guy come up to you and go, oh hi, what's your number? I'll just say yes to people because I'd feel wanted. Much like yourself in my life I was constantly seeking um, fulfillment and to raise my esteem and to boost my confidence through anything imaginable. I would chase anything. Whether it was relationships, whether it was, you know, something like alcohol, I made horrible decisions. And I was a good kid, but I made horrible decisions. You're a good kid. You're just not making great decisions. But just like me, you can make a choice and you can begin to change, and you're doing that this week. My hope and my prayer for you, Ross, is that you've got the strength to continue, and I believe you do.
It's the teenager's last day in Alabama. And Mark has one final request for Ross. I want to ask you to uh, enable the privacy function. There's no reason why anonymous people should be able to come onto your page and leave a, abusive, negative, horrifyingly detrimental comments. All right, is that okay? Yeah. Are you in agreement with that? Yeah. I would like to be able to not use it as much. I know for myself I would never be able to get rid of it. I don't even want to get rid of it. That's not my aim. I think more of an aim is to try and maybe find something else to do other than my space and I'm not uh, when I'm at home. The Garnets have invited some friends round for a goodbye barbecue. I've collapsed on the floor, wetting myself. My friends next to me on on the they're dying literally. Steams come up their head. While the barbecue is in full swing, Mark has a few words of encouragement for the British teens. Think about the things we talked about this week. Do you know what's to do and what not to do? And um, you know, be respectful to your mom, as you will be, and know that they love you. And you have an opportunity to start fresh, you know, with every bit of confidence and faith in you. Thank you. you know, you've got what it takes. I believe in you. Thank I really you. do. Don't worry about what's happened in the past. You can't do a thing about it. But you can take care of today. You're going to have a great life, my friend, and I hope we'll stay in touch. And I'll tell you one last thing. I would be proud to have you as my son. Yeah. And I thank you for letting me be your dad this week. Thank you so man, it's, it's been a pleasure. Oh, man. It's it's been okay. Thank you so much. I'm really going to miss them. And it has been such a pleasure to be here this week. It's been hard, but it's, it's been worth it. Here we go. Leave them with a great attitude, and I pray when they step off that plane that it just energizes them to continue that. I really do. Very much looking forward to now to becoming the boss I was, the original me, the happy, smiley, jokey boss. I think when I get to that stage again, I think a lot of things will change, a lot of things will be different. Never really sat down and talked with either of my parents about my feelings. Never really sat down and talked about what's happened and why everything's happened and the past and stuff and how we can just move forward and make it a positive thing. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Hi, Dad. Hello. Mum Ross. I'm sorry for what I've obviously been like in the past. Because it made me realise to say thank you more for stuff. Because the kids out there, well, it's just like, I think the only words I've ever heard them say is, thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> don't expect me to call you ma'am, no. so that's <laughs> never going to happen. <laughs> First thing I'd really love from her is a hug. A hug and a cuddle. And I hope she had a good experience. I really hope she found a, another little piece of herself. Gosh, okay, careful. Oh, thank you. It's not my birthday. It was yesterday. I spent my birthday with you. Oh no. There you are. What have I learned? To not be so selfish, to think of others before myself, um, the consequence of my actions. I'm just going to try and treat you nicer and like help, help you more around the house and stuff. I missed you. I missed you too. Did you? Hello, baby. I love you, baby.